Barca. <laughs> we can like. Okay, it says we are live streaming already, but this is, uh, I can see that YouTube is still working on processing us. And so here we are, great. And now I'm going to start the webinar. Christian, are you ready? Uh, yes, so one question. So when I start the screen sharing, can we still see the other people when I introduce them? Or yes, we're in gallery, like, gallery okay. view, mm -hmm. so people should see us. Okay, I'm starting okay, it then now. <laughs> Yeah, we can okay. see people are coming in, Christian. Yeah, it looks like people are coming in. Nice. So we can wait uh, maybe for a minute mm -hmm. before we start, really. <laughs> Shall I put up my slides already or we wait a little bit, to be honest? Let's yeah, I try. guess you, you can already do that. Um, okay. Okay. Great. I mean, I think um, we're in gallery gallery view, so everybody should be able to see us also. Mm -hmm. Now okay. I can't see the participants' uh, accounts anymore, but maybe you just tell me when you think it's uh, we're ready to go. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, we are at 110 at the moment, and um, I would expect around um, 200, 250. But you know, some people may join a little later. Mm -hmm. um so maybe let's wait for another minute and mm -hmm. uh, perfect we can get started so we don't get behind schedule mm -hmm. so everybody who's there already welcome to this webinar <laughs> we're still waiting for more participants but uh ready to kick this off soon It's really strange to talk into your computer uh, like <laughs> this, but <laughs> that's the best we get currently. So, <laughs> At least you don't have to wear a mouthpiece. Yeah, exactly. That really helps. <laughs> okay. Okay, Christian, I think... Um... We're good to go. We're at 150 at the moment. I suppose people will come in along. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Then let's uh, get this started. I hope you can all see my slides and hear me well. Um, so a warm welcome to all of you somewhere out there uh, in your offices or locked down into your homes or basements as I often am. It's a, a really a big pleasure to kick off this uh, webinar series on the geography of sustainability transitions. I'm Christian Binz. I'm group leader at AirVac uh, in Switzerland and also um, affiliate researcher at Circle at Lund University. And I'm joined here um, with the uh, organizing committee um, of this uh, event. So on the, the side, you will see um, Bernhard Schroffer, Lars Kuhnen and Jim Murphy. So Bernhard will uh, be active in today's session and Lars and Jim will sort of chip in later in the webinar series. If you could maybe wave quickly, or I guess you can see their faces, yeah. <laughs> Then we also got the technical support um, uh, here on the panel. So Jonas Heiberg and Miriam Hacker, who were really an amazing support in, uh, you know, setting up the background materials and the web page and uh, making this uh, webinar sort of interface work. So um, maybe some housekeeping before we start with the sort of content of this today's webinar. First of all, as you've seen, you will always have to register for all the five sessions we plan separately. So you can go to our homepage or... Um, we also send follow-up uh, emails with the registration links for the next uh, session. So you always have to um, register um, uh, and get your private links for the next sessions. Um, so if you have, um, we also um, basically on the, this interface, we activated the Q&A feature and the chat feature. So the idea is that if you have questions on the content of the presentations, then put that in the Q&A. And if you have other questions, also technical questions or other sort of discussions on the side, then do that in the chat. Uh, this keeps the Q&A sort of clean and easier for the moderators to sort of find the you know, relevant questions and pass them on to the presenters. Um, the sessions will also all be recorded. We're also currently live streaming on uh, YouTube and it will be put online after the, 
webinar so you can uh, also find the background materials and the sort of background presentations which we share uh, for each of the sessions um, yes and please follow us on the, also the, the social media and just check the web page if you need more information um, so today's webinar i think it's really exciting we have had more than 450 registrations um, um, from all over the planet, basically. And it's really funny in a way, because I remember when we had one of the first uh, sessions on the geography of transitions at an AHE conference, we were actually booked in a really big room for like 300 people, but we only had 15 or 20 people on that uh, in that session, basically. And so today it's the opposite. So we have several hundred people interested in this topic, but no venue to meet, except for this uh, online um, sort of uh, interface. But anyways, um, we actually uh, wanted to get to know you a little bit better, uh, despite all the constraints. So we set up a, a poll, which I, I hope you will uh, fill, fill in so we can get a feeling of who's actually joining and um, what you're interested in. So this will pop up and please, um, cast your votes and I promise that we'll have results quicker than you know the results from the US <laughs> presidential elections. <laughs> uh, so we'll share them as soon as we have a clear tendency here. Um, okay, so today, uh, the, the schedule for today is first that I will give a short introduction to the webinar. Then we have the mini keynote by Bernhard Schroffer on this multi-scalar perspective on transitions. Then a short discussion by Robert Hussink, and then an open Q&A for about 30 minutes. And I will kick this off with giving you some background on you know, why we um, organized this uh, webinar. And there's, of course, uh, several reasons. Uh, one is that we've seen that this um, uh, field has been growing very quickly in the past uh, 10 years. And we've also seen that it's been diversifying into different communities, both in geography and transition studies. So it's gotten more and more difficult to keep track of what's going on um, in this field. So we thought, thought it's a good moment now to take a step back and take stock of what's going on, identify and discuss the most interesting and salient uh, research teams. Secondly, um, when this geography of transition field was um, established, we had quite some review papers to try to make sense of what was going on, but this has then quieted down a little bit. And um, then last year we got a, a agenda paper by the transitions community, um, which we were not totally satisfied with because we thought they had a special section on geography of transitions, which however didn't really represent, I think the broad sort of interesting work that has already happened at the interface of geography and transition perspectives. So then we thought about maybe um, publishing another agenda paper, but then we thought this is maybe not the most interesting thing to do. It would be much better, much more interesting to um, open a more open, inclusive debate about what GOST really is about and where it could be heading and you know what the contours of a joint research agenda would be. So we wanted to create a sort of a more living agenda instead of just writing uh, additional papers. Um, and then the third um, reason is, of course, that um, in times of um, COVID-19, um, it's really hard to keep a community up and running. And so we thought it would be nice to have a, a sort of an online go-to place for the GOST community where we can um, exchange and plan sort of new joint um, events. And we also use this um, opportunity to kickstart an, uh, a thematic group in the Sustainability Transition Research Network on the Geography of Transitions, which would be a forum where we can sort of coordinate and come up with follow-up activities to this uh, first webinar here. Okay, so overall, the main aim is to initiate this open and inclusive forum for debate about what GOST is all about, where it's, uh, you know, where it might be heading in the future and what the most interesting themes are. Um, so here's the structure of the introduction. Um, I will first try to de define this um, field a little bit, then map out recent work and interesting conceptual trading zones and shortly motivate why we think it's nice to engage in deeper dialogues and then outline the structure of this webinar series. Um, so basically uh, defining the geography of transitions is not an easy task um, because it's a really broad sort of community of scholars in different uh, fields. So I ventured back into the review, early review papers and their definitions of the field. So uh, Kuhn et al in 2012 said that it's basically a research agenda at the interface of geography and transition studies which um, develops new theories and concepts on the one hand side on the spatial institutional embeddedness and then also on the multi-scalarity of green innovation and sustainability transition trajectories. A few years later, 
um, Jim Murphy put it um, in a more condensed form and said that GOST should account for the role that multiscalar, spatial, and context-specific factors play in shaping uh, transitions, basically. And there's um, uh, some sort of basic questions that are often asked in this field, which is, for example, why do transitions occur in one place and not in another? How do they unfold across different geographical contexts? And then what's the importance and role of certain relations at the different spatial scales for transition processes? Now, I think this sounds all a bit, um, of course, generic. So I tried to visualize a little bit what the key puzzle, you know, in my understanding is for the GOST field. Um, and I took the, the poster child of transition studies, the German energy transition, to illustrate this a little bit. This is going to be very generic. Please don't, don't kind of roast me on the details here. But I think basically what we often in transition studies, that this is portrayed as the German energy transition, as uh, the dynamic that has played out at the national level in Germany. So the national government creating a feed-in tariff, which then induced all sort of niche activities that scaled up and started to challenge the fossil fuel regime in a way. So when you look at it from a ge geog geographer's perspective, you find a very fascinating, I think, spatial storyline behind this um, so sort of seeming national transition. Um, so first of all, in the early phase, what we see is actually a, a, a network of sort of um, regional um, initiatives where specific um, you know, innovators in local niches were sort of tinkering with um, on-site PV panel and wind turbine solutions. Um, sort of, this was all rooted very much in an anti-nuclear um, sort of movement context uh, with very progressive uh, environmental agendas. And then, uh, you know, people started to scale out and up from these early niche context to sort of regional uh, policy levels. In the sort of at the end of the 90s, then uh, the Red Green Coalition came into power and took these ideas and certain policy um, sort of interventions like feed and tariffs to a national level. And then the, the dynamic got to a whole new level, basically, also including international developments with the Kyoto Protocol, which set first goals for decarbonization of the energy sector, and so on. So then in the third phase, we see a very important international sort of industrial dynamics when China basically um, basically took up most of the manufacturing in the PV field um, and brought the prices for these technologies down by orders of magnitude, which then again allowed Germany to uh, sort of speed up the diffusion um, of these um, you know, solar solutions at a much faster pace. Similar interaction with you know, other regions in the EU, which also imposed feed-in tariffs, and then again also you know, international interaction that played an important role. And now finally, in this last phase from about 2015, we see that that's really like a deep sectoral transformation is happening in Germany now, with the old incumbent sort of power utilities getting almost bankrupt, new actors booming, uh, a lot of sort of policy debates at the national level, and then also a lot of sort of you know, variegated impacts of this transition on all industrial regions and new regions that develop these clean tech industries and so on. And so what's interesting here, I think, if you look at this story, then um, it's hard to understand or explain this with the conventional theories we have from transition studies or human geography. So the MLP, multi-level perspective, would not be able to take stock of these complex dynamics. And the same goes probably for regional, regional innovation system approaches, or something like that. So what you really need is a sort of combined perspectives on spatial and sectorial dynamics how they play out over time and in sort of, you know, in international multiscalar space. And I think if GOST is, is actually able to make sense of these developments in a better way, I think we have really important sort of insights to contribute to policymaking to say where and when and how exactly could you intervene in transitions and, uh, you know, in such a complex situation as here, the seemingly German energy transition. Okay, so... As a next step, next step, maybe to um, also motivate the, the framing of this first webinar, um, I tried to map out a little bit what recent work is doing in GOST field. And uh, this was, of course, also really hard because um, it still is emerging into disciplinary domain uh, without a clear conceptual or methodological core. And the relevant contributions, they are scattered uh, over various sort of empirical domains and also in different disciplines like geography, transition studies, uh, organizational sociology, political economy, and so on. Um, there's also no stable or institutionalized form of exchange, sort of only loosely sort of coordinated uh, activities. And I think the, we still have a lot of need for sense-making 
the identification of joint research teams and uh, creation of boundary objects uh, that we can all relate to. So what we put up here is like a first suggestion of how we see the field and how to cut the cake a little bit into interesting sub-themes. But that doesn't mean that this is the, the, the only way you can frame this or the best way even. So it's more intended to sort of kick off the debate. And then we hope to spur a lot of follow-up um, activities that look into uh, complementary additional sort of issues that were not in the focus here. So I did a sort of quick and dirty, um, you know, screening of Scopus uh, to come up with a sort of a heat map where interesting themes lie between transition studies, human, or in our case, often economic geography, and then regional and urban studies. And I think there's four areas where a lot of work has already happened. Uh, which is really interesting. One is on the multiscalarity. So Bernhard will give a snapshot of you know some work that's happening at this uh, in this sort of thematic area. Then um, quite a lot of work in evolutionary economic geography and new industrial path development. Michaela Triple will give a snapshot of you know what's happening there. Um, you know, actually looking into how new industries develop in regions, especially also clean tech industries and green industries more recently. And then uh, a lot of important work comes from urban uh, studies. Uh, I put here urban experimentation, urban ecology, urban governance, sort of as important thematic areas, but there's certainly more there. And a lot of, I would say also the foundational work on GeoST has actually come from, from these perspectives. Then there's um, three additional themes which are booming more recently. Um, one is the work on transitions and green innovation in developing and emerging economies. Um, then there's um, work on uh, more and more work on institutional perspectives on transition, both in, I would say, in geography and transition studies, these sort of institutional perspectives have taken up quite some momentum recently. And also there we'll have a presentation by Simone Strambach in this webinar series. And then also grassroots and community initiatives and their role in uh, wider transition dynamics. <clears throat> and then finally, there's two, let's say, more boutique themes that are really interesting too. One is sort of placemaking theories and their impact on the field. So Jim Murphy will go into this. And then also the sort of more critical perspectives looking at the power politics and you know justice issues around um, uh, transitions and also you know their sort of impacts, the, the variegated impacts in different places. Okay, so when we try to group these themes together, there's like some sort of clusters. So first of all, I think the EEG, new green industrial path development and also institutional structure agency debates have converged a bit recently. Catching up, leapfrogging, multiscalarity is of course closely connected. People looking into emerging developing economies have often emphasized the sort of multiscalarity of transition dynamics. And then there's this big um, uh, cluster of work in the urban transition field. And then, as I said, these additional newly emerging uh, topics that fit in. And so in this webinar, we try to cover this matrix as good as we can. So we will have sessions that focus on these four thematic areas. Um, and so we also, of course, um, downplay a little bit the, the urban sort of aspects and also the catching up and leapfrogging work, mostly because there's similar initiatives going on at the moment with the Global South web webinar, which, as you've seen before, our webinar, which are, is doing really interesting stuff. And also in the urban um, transition field, there's a lot of um, uh, additional activities that are happening already. So we try to rather sort of develop a more sort of complementary uh, perspective here. This again doesn't mean that this is complete or like that we should only stick to those themes, but more like this is the first take for this first webinar series and we hope to expand after that. Okay, so then very quickly, why is it interesting to engage in this dialogue and get uh, deeper there? Uh, of course, it's really hard to talk between sort of disciplines. Um, it's always different languages that you need to adapt to. And, you know, there's uh, a lot of misunderstandings too. But at the same time, there's also a lot of uh, opportunity for breakthrough innovation, I would say, if you manage to find productive interfaces between two streams of thinking. And I think we've seen a lot of promising work in the GOST field in this um, domain already. Um, so there's a few things we can take from this. Uh, I put just a few ideas, you know, what we can achieve if we uh, deepen this dialogue. One is that I think we could overcome a bias towards sort of local transition dynamics, which exists in both transition studies and economic, economic geography to some degree, and you know, get a handle of these multiscalar dynamics that also Bernhard will point out later. I think we can systematize in much more detail how transformation of cities, regions, nations sort of co-evolves with transformation of sectors and how they actually influence each other quite closely. 
Um, and ideally, I think we could also uh, enable more systematic cross comparison because what is often sort of highly contextual case studies, both in geography and transition studies, and this will probably need some, um, I think, methodological innovation too. And finally, if we manage to do all this, I think we can really provide decision makers also with better recommendations on how, where and when to intervene in these complex systems and try to support or steer um, transformations to sustainable development. Okay, so now very quickly about the structure of this webinar series. Um, basically, um, we always try to pair uh, a person with a background in geography with one with a background in transition studies in each of the session and let them talk to each other with the presentation and discuss it. And then we also try to implement sort of a funnel logic. Uh, conceptually, we start with a very broad overarching theme and then move more into sort of more concrete conceptual ideas. And we also go from a sort of a very international spatial scale to a regional sort of scales and then more to a, an urban scale. Um, and in the end, we will have a roundtable discussion, which allows us then to sort of make sense of the prior sessions to identify the contours of a um, sort of emerging uh, joint research agenda and then to be concrete about, OK, what do we want to do next? Um, follow-up webinars, special sessions, special issues. Um, what do we want to do in the Esther and thematic group? And you're all very much invited to contribute to this, to get in touch with us, come up with ideas and initiatives that you know we could also pull off after this, this first sort of kickoff webinar. Okay, so that's it for my side with a very short introduction. So I would like to give the word directly to uh, the presenter of today, uh, Ben Hartruffer. I think you might have heard his name before because he has actually published on geography of transition from the start quite extensively. And uh, the discussant is going to be Professor uh, Robert Hussink from Kiel University and Newcastle University. And um, he has also published extensively on um, industrial restructuring, regional development policies, and also on the sort of paradigms in economic geography. So I'm sure he's going to have very interesting sort of complementary insights to Bernhardt's sort of transition based perspective. So uh, it's like 20 minutes presentation by Bernhardt, 10 minutes for a discussant, and then we have time for an open discussion in the end. So Bernhardt, the floor is yours if Zoom lets you present. Yes. Is it all right? No, it's not. Uh... Still need to go into presentation mode. Yes, yes, yes. No? OK. Uh, that's, that's still the wrong uh, <laughs> presentation oh, <yeah>. mode. Yeah. <laughs> this? Yes, so now we're there. <laughs> so, okay. OK, thanks a lot, Christian. And um, very welcome also from my side. I'm really happy to see this uh, strong turnout for the topic and the rising interest. Um, I will give a very short and perhaps a little bit hasty presentation um, over a topic, um, the, the, how to address the multiscalarity, mostly from a transition studies point of view, and talk you through some recent developing developments and remaining challenges. Um, I guess the, the, the starting point is that the sustainability transitions research has sort of mostly ignored the geographical dimension in general and multiscalarity in particular. And we see now increasingly that new conceptual ideas come up when you start to engage with these sort of challenges. Also new methodologies, I would just hint to one at the end. Um, and last but not least, it's the, the range of and relevance of phenomena that we can address uh, increases dramatically. And that's of course um, what we would be happy to, to address. Let me just, be, uh, as before I really start, also say that this is a very personal view, uh, perhaps too much of a personal view. It's just a sort of a report of over the, the years how we have tried to make sense um, from starting from the transitions concepts, from the frameworks, to address, to reach out into um, multiscalarity and other geographical dimensions. And so it's certainly not everything you could um, say or want to know about multiscalarity. So just bear with me uh, for a rushed roller coaster through some ideas and methods and illustrations. So I would uh, very shortly start with uh, what is social sector transitions about and the core concepts. Uh, why there is a need to uh, have a look at the global or rather the multiscalar dimension. Um, I would then um, elaborate on two extensions that we have been developing over the last 10 years, perhaps, or even shorter, about how to, um, to incorporate the multiscalar view in uh, innovation dynamics and also on regime change. And then conclude with some 
preliminary insights how to address, potentially address global transitions. Um, so let's say, let me start with a sort of a, a stylized fact, um, which at least in my uh, life was sort of a, a really an interesting development. So let's say in the early 90s, um, sustainability transitions was sort of an empty um, concept or a hopeful monstrosity, whereas by now we see a sort of a, a clear reality um, over these 30 years, you know, from sort of soapbox alternative technologies to very mature and, and increasingly globalizing industries. And this is uh, indicated by um, standard indicators like learning curve effects uh, in electricity or PV uh, generation costs, um, which are now um, even competitive to in the um, wholesale market, electricity market. And last but not least, from a geographer's point of view, uh, a strong globalization of these developments. So at the same time, also around the beginning of the 90s, the uh, sustainability transitions research started um, as very tiny initiatives. And let's say still to this date, I would say it's, it can be summarized in three major research questions. The first one is about how to develop and uh, follow up on uh, new industries. So nurture hopeful monstrosities, as it has, has been called from the very early beginning, like the soapboxes on four wheels up to the full maturation and what happens in between and how can we know where the developments are, etc. The second point is, of course, um, if you read interested in transitions, there's always path dependencies and resistance from incumbents. And this can be incumbents like uh, producers um, or consumers that and how can they be overcome and what happens in the struggle of the transformation process. And finally, of course, um, we're talking here about public policy issues, grand challenges. So it's something that we can assume will not be arrived at by the, the unfettered market processes. So there is some need for external intervention and steering and guiding. So how can we conceive of transition policies in a sense? And in a nutshell, I would say the whole transition research turns around these sort of core questions. Um, I will jump over this very quickly um, because, you know, we don't have time to for a proper introduction into transition studies, but let's say there's sort of two salient frameworks that resonate with the, the major research questions. The one is uh, how to think about deep sexual transformations and here the MLP got a lot of salience over the years. And the other one is to better understand the scaling and maturing of industry industries where the technological innovation system got sort of um, mainstream in transition studies at least uh, and i will build on these these two over the time so of course the starting point of this whole webinar series is um, that there's a need to be more explicit about the geography and uh, i guess it's fair to say and we said it already 2012 so it's it's still it hasn't been challenged that uh, the, the the original transition studies had a spatial blind spot and this despite that uh, if you look at the drivers of su sustainability transitions, you have many global aspects like global environmental change or also global development. Um, we see increasingly global industry dynamics, but on the other hand side, we see national policies that are prevalent and innovation contexts often be um, uh, structured at the local or regional level. So there is a sort of a tension between scales, you know, that has to be accommodated for, but actually the transition studies as they develop, they have just privileged very much uh, a national focus um, over the year. Well, that's, that's the original analysis, but and it has improved over time, but let's say the founding context was a lot in the national context. For the MLP, it was a lot about national sector transformation. So how did uh, PV develop in Germany? How did it not result in a success in the Netherlands? Um, what, how was biogas developed in Denmark compared to wind in Denmark, etc.? And for the TIS analysis, it was a lot about the orientation at national industrial policy. So um, the, the, the point, of course, you know, if you think about the actual transitions as they happen in the real world, um, just show a totally different picture. You know, there's there's nothing like a, a priori national focus, so to speak. And we see here, for instance, uh, from a study from Christian Pins and colleague, uh, here, Pins and Tong and Tunteler, um, about the developments in manufacturing and uh, markets in PV and how the geographical centers shifted over time. And so if you want to uh, access, assess these sort of developments, you really have to um, understand or be able to address these sort of multiscalarity issues. And this all was obviously coupled directly um, with the maturation 
in terms of um, you know decreasing costs and by this expanding the the, the market potential and so the whole transition uh, drive let's say the motor of, of transition um, has a lot to do with these sort of geographical relationships. Okay, so let's say the, the starting point um, is, is now um, how can we um, better understand and address these sort of um, multiscalar uh, developments. And I will start with the uh, innovation dynamics, the industry dynamics. Um, and so let's say that we adopted already like 10 years ago, we did a, a number of studies on different technologies, which were sort of conventional in the TIS framework, where you sort of assess the different functions, as it's called, the structures and the functions. And you say, well, for Germany, for instance, in uh, membrane bioreactor technology, how well is knowledge generation relative, uh, developed relative to the development stage of the system? What about resource mobilization, guidance of search, market formation, legitimacy, and so on? And then at the end, you can have a sort of an assessment of the situation of the TIS in the national context of Germany. Of course, you can do the same in other countries. And then sort of an interesting question comes up. Um, so is there anything that's overarching? Is there a bigger picture here? And we tried to, to phrase this. But then increasingly got um, um, aware, of course, that there is sort of um, things we have to uh, re um, respect when just going a, a level higher up and to try to have the, the whole picture. These are sort of actors and networks and institutions that are not limited to national containers. And at the same time, we also found sort of new functions or processes, uh, activities that have to be run um, through value chain formation course, global value chains, etc. So this was the starting point. And then we said, oh, we have to start all over from the other side, going back to the original statement by Carlson and Stankiewicz, which wrote a founding paper in technological innovation systems analysis and say, OK, let's just follow the networks of the technology wherever they lead. And only after the fact, decide whether you know, specific countries or national contexts are prevalent or play a a specific role. So this was the first study on um, knowledge networks, um, very conventional co-authorship network analysis, where um, we followed the membrane bioreactor technology over 10 years or so. Um, and we found that this had, um, had been organized from the beginning as a global network. And that over time, and there were some like subsystems emerging that um, looked like you know, subsystems that you could sort of defend of analyzing as uh, in uh, national context in which technological innovation systems would develop, like Korea, South Korea, you know, where it's, uh, we have lots of interlinkages within the country, a few external, etc. But if you go to other countries and contexts like Germany, you see that this is very strongly embedded um, in the European Union, and you cannot understand really what's going on when only focusing on Germany. France has a lot of transnational companies, but it doesn't look like anything, etc. So let's say that what came out of this study um, is, of course, that um, these different functions, you know, like knowledge production, they have a, a, a multi-scalar reality by itself, and we have to address the this formation in these, uh, in these terms. Let's say knowledge generation is sort of easy um, to... Oh, sorry, did I just lose it? Sorry, sorry. Am I back on track now? Yes, looking good, good again, yes. <laughs> yes, okay, sorry, sorry. Mismanipulation. <laughs> um, so let's say knowledge generation was sort of easy because you have this global database, you have patterns, you have uh, scientific publications that you can just run the algorithms. And still a lot of work, you know, but uh, um, it's easy to do. But then the question always come up, yeah, can you also do this for the softer indicators, you know, like, in particular about legitimacy. And so we very freshly hot from the press, we just got a paper accepted in economic geography where we approached uh, legitimacy geography um, for new technologies. Uh, it's about modular water technologies, let's say essentially decentralized water treatment, um, which we analyzed through um, a set of 180 newspapers, uh, English speaking newspapers, and you start to identify the hotspots of legitimation activities 
um, for these um, for these regions. And uh, I will come back to that at the very end, uh, what you can <clears throat> really do from a TIS uh, um, analysis point of view. But what became also very clear at this is not a flat um, geography, but it's an interconnected geography, because many of the storylines of the narratives of the legitimation activities, they also travel. You know, so you have um, actors that um, act at the global scale that refer to things that happen in different places. You have direct links between places, uh, pinpointing to um, um, experiences, etc. So also for legitimation, we can just say there's a sort of a multi-scale and network structure um, that you have to grasp in order to see how the different places relate to each other and what sort of the outcome could be. Um, so. Very shortly, we sort of said, well, how, what, how does this impact? If this is the, the underlying reality, so how does this impact our thinking and conceptualization of technology innovation system structures? And we came up with the Global Innovation System Framework, um, which we published three years ago. And essentially, to keep it very short, um, just had to introduce two elements, um, but which are sort of still novel in, in terms of thinking. One is to identify subsystems, you know, that we say, well, it's uh, what happened in Germany, PV in the 90s and 2000s, looks like a coherent, um, quite independent subsystem, but which was still connected to other places. And then perhaps, um, and these subsystems uh, may happen at different scales, at the global scale, at the national scale, at the regional scale. And, but for the overall innovation system to work, of course, there must be interlinkages between these. And that's what we call structural couplings. Uh, interlinkages can be, or structural couplings can be uh, transnational companies, so actors that are um, active at different places, institutions, networks, etc. So um, just to show you what kind of uh, research questions you can then start to ask, um, that's uh, also work from Kristen Vincent, Laura diaz and um, about uh, how to explain how um, uh, China got sort of uh, to the top of the producers in, in uh, PV photovoltaic and solar PV. And uh, they could just convincingly show that the, the starting of this industry was much more due to the ability to anchor resources from the outside compared to national indigenous uh, development processes. Yeah. This just as a short illustration, I have to be very quick. So this is uh, like the first um, part, or let's say that the first major question and that I addressed, so how to better understand um, in, uh, industry maturation and uh, epitomized by the technological innovation systems uh, concept in a transnational um, context and, and just start to understand the global geography of technological innovation system maturation, emergence and maturation. The second big thing, if you want to talk about um, tra transitions is of course, um, we have to talk about what are the incumbent structures, what is to be overcome, what is to be transformed. And um, <clears throat> very frankly, we believe that the MLP as it was originally cast is sort of not very well suited. It's very difficult to bring the multi-scalar perspective into this. So we had in parallel worked on uh, a sort of reconceptualization or reframing of the, not the MLP really, because it's not a multi-level perspective anymore, but <clears throat> about the, the core concept of incumbent structures, namely the social technical regime. And doing this from a sort of a, 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 a new institutional perspective, and we were just um, working a lot with uh, concepts like uh, institutional work and institutional logics, et cetera. But just to be very short still, um, we um, sort of try to understand the social technical regime as a sort of a, the core, the highly institutionalized core of an organizational field. And an organizational field, you can re easily understand that's whatever happens, you know, if you say um, about here, it was about um, urban water management in Australia, or it could be photovoltaics in, in Germany. So whoever has any sort of activity um, uh, will be uh, depicted here or considered. And we the, the radar plot that you see here sort of nicely um, summarizes the, the way of thinking by saying, well, you have certain aspects, um, institutional aspects like organizational forms, values, even actors and technologies um, that um, elements of a regime can relate to. And the, the, the gradient from the center to the periphery <clears throat> represents a sort of a degree of institutionalization. So the elements that are more to the core are more highly institutionalized and those to the, the rim 
are more um, loosely institutionalized. And then it's sort of an easy step to say, okay, then the regime is probably what happens in the core, whatever there is. And we added a twist with institutional logics to, to say that probably the core is not homogeneous, homogeneous uh, by any means, but you can have sort of different institutional logics that, that are at play and that create frictions and their own dynamics. I cannot go into that, but just to provide you with the core idea, is to say, um, if you understand the regime like this, this has some advantages in our point, uh, point of view, namely <clears throat> that you can um, then discuss about alternative social technical systems, uh, which is conventionally conceived as niches, and um, you don't have to be so dichotomous about it, but it becomes more like a, a gradient uh, issue. Um, imagine, for instance, desalination for urban water management you can have very decentralized forms of desalination and very centralized. And depending on other context conditions, this can just strengthen the existing regime or it can fundamentally challenge the regime. And so the technological field as such is not easy to categorize in sort of either marginal or a, a, a center reinforcing kind of intervention. But more importantly, transitions also get sort of um, more subtle. You can approach them in a more subtle way in saying, well, the, <clears throat> the changes, which in the MLP are due to landscape forces, can be depicted that sort of out, outside developments like climate change or um, neoliberalism, of course, they, they shift or they change the positionality of the different elements. And this will, will lead to transformations and shifts and, uh, in the regime itself, <clears throat> and may enable uh, new developments uh, of different sorts. This uh, maturation and scaling is then an issue that intervenes into this field and provides new options, et cetera, new connections to, to sort of logics, et cetera. Uh, tensions of logics can be uh, measures of, um, or sources of dynamics. And of course, also institutional work, let's say agency uh, from actors, just pushing from one for one solution or rather than another, et cetera. So essentially we come from this sort of multi-layered um, understanding of a regime and then finally uh, transitions to something flatter, but at the same, same time also much more multi-dimensional and open um, in conceptual terms, etc. But let me stop it here. Um, I, the, the question is, once you have uh, accepted this sort of view, um, it's very easy to, well, at, as a starting point, <laughs> to, to bring in multiscalarity because you can say, okay, some of these um, elements, you know, the rules um, of the game, in technologies, also in terms of dominant actors, et cetera, values, um, are sort of rather homogenous globally. Uh, and then they can be considered as a sort of a, a global regime, as Christian Binz and Leo Fimschilling uh, put it in, in one of their papers. Um, and the assumption, the implicit assumption in much of the transitions literature is also that the regimes are out there in the air and they're just the same everywhere, more or less. But actually, if you go into empirical analysis, you see that um, at the level of regions, you will recognize similar patterns, you know, that are sort of copy pasted, copycatted from the global level. But you also see a lot of regional variation. And you go to another region, you see other variations. So there is the structures which against which you have to sort of the, to fight or to <laughs> come up in order to develop sustainability transitions are sort of different to a lesser or a bigger degree. Um, and of course, you know, there's sort of interconnections between the global uh, rules and the, the, the national rules. So in the end, you also get a sort of a multi-scalar networks of regime structures that have more or less variation. That's a more an empirical question. So just to illustrate, if you have now, you know, I introduced like a multi-scalar view on the innovation systems and a multi-scalar view on the regime structures. So um, uh, let's say uh, this would result in, a, in an analysis if you're interested in a specific country of saying what uh, is a new initiatives happening and how do they interact with the, the existing uh, national regime. <clears throat> then you have to be aware that of course this national innovation system is embedded in and interconnected to a global innovation system. Um, and you, it would probably be appropriate in many cases to think about certain external linkages that are um, important to understand what's going on. At the same time, the, the regime itself is sort of interconnected with the sort of global structures and, and uh, regime structures in other places. So essentially, we have to talk about how these um, interactions happen at different places and how they mutually shape 
um, what's going on and whether this will result in a, ultimately in a transition or not. So you might say, oh, great, now you have stockpiled, you know, so many highly complex uh, concepts that no one will, you know, you get this in your head and you don't know what to do anymore. And to that, of course, you know, we are, we are aware of that, but this didn't stop us from continuing working. So the first thing I would like to say is, um, of course, it, you will very rarely, you will do a full size global regime, global TIS analysis to really understand what happened since the beginning of the times until today and where the options are. You will always cut out, depending on your research question, certain parts and relationships and structural couplings and um, to make sense what's going on. I guess this overarching um, oversized sort of conceptual framework is more like getting aware where, where in, uh, important connections could be and then to, to relate to these if appropriate. So in the end, it can still uh, be used in, in very you know, cut down and specific research questions. And rarely you will have a sort of a look on, on the, at the whole picture. Still, we try to have a look on the whole picture, <laughs> of course. And this leads us, um, I have to be very short here. Um, of course, you have to endeavor into new sort of methodologies to, to be able to grasp the bigger pictures um, in this sense. And so we ventured into sort of new methods at the interface between discourse analysis and social network analysis and are about to to use it, we, hope, we think in a meaningful way to, to get sort of bigger picture developments <clears throat> in an appropriate way and, in, and also in a sort of novel way. And so what you see here, this is based on the 180 newspaper articles that I introduced before, and we coded um, um, inter, in, uh, alignments between technologies and, uh, and value considerations um, or institutional factors. Um, as uttered by specific actors. And this can be aggregated um, into networks of topics or actors, uh, networks of actors. And then uh, with um, social network analysis uh, methods, um, you can calculate indicators like centrality, which let you draw these sort of pictures. And um, just for a moment, just to accept that these pictures represent a sort of a radar plot of uh, niche and regime dynamics. That's the most easiest way to look at it. You see the green elements um, are the niche technologies, the modular water treatment technologies, whereas the, the blue ones are centralized conventional regime um, elements. The diamonds are technologies and the circles are more institutional dimensions. And the, this covers a, a time range from <clears throat> 2011 to 18, so eight years. And, we, and in the middle, the middle period was uh, one with strong um, droughts in the US and in South Africa. And what you see here at the global level, so we took all the global actors that were voiced or reported in the newspapers uh, articles. And you see that at the beginning, um, there was uh, the first phase that it's very clear that the centralized paradigm is in the middle. In the, during the droughts in the US and in South Africa, we see that the, the niche technologies sort of grow stronger in terms of coverage um, um, from, um, from newspapers, but still, let's say in the core, you have so economic rationale, sustainability rationales, which are still very strongly connected to the, the centralized solutions. And after the drought, uh, sort of things fall back into normal, or let's say it's, it's not, not much is happening. And um, we can also count then the, the supportive um, statements uh, by these actors. And you see a, a slight um, increase uh, in favor of the decentralized technologies. And we can also look at um, the actors that make these statements. And also here we see over the three periods um, above, you have the, those statements that are conducive to modular technologies, which stays quite constant in the type of actors um, and the same for the centralized uh, so solution. So you would say, okay, we had a, over this eight year period with a major external landscape shock. Uh, we didn't see much, a little bit of a maturing of the niche discourse, but actually nothing much that would threaten the regime in any way. That's about That's two minutes, not, Bernhard. Pardon? About two minutes left. Yeah, I'm in, done in two Perfect. minutes. Um, because it's before last uh, one. And so if you go to the US, uh, you see as uh, quite a different pattern. So this is the same at the beginning. And then a more mixed situation during the drought. So um, modular technology is getting much more salience. And then in the end, after the drought, even the, the decentralized technologies get sort of a 
um, a stronger position in the media coverage. We see that the, the percentage of uh, cover, uh, positive coverage increases more strongly than at the global level. And most interestingly is that we see that the, the um, actor structure is sort of developing from a sort of a research and NGO driven discourse to something that's more um, driven by um, public authorities and companies. So I would say that what we can see here at last, and you know, we still have to develop these methods further, but we can sort of um, analyze these sort of dynamics at different scalar, scalar levels. And by the way, we have the same for South Africa and Israel and India and Singapore and the UK. So you can really go through the hotspots that we saw on the former map and then see how the discourse is developed there and what sort of potentials for lead markets or niche markets uh, or uh, policy support um, could be feasible or, or more likely in these different contexts. And with this, we can sort of approximate um, a sort of a multi-scalar um, industry dynamic and regime um, uh, transition dynamics um, over time. Let me just conclude my last slide. So what are the expected benefits of elaborating such a geography of transitions? Um, of course, a spatially differentiated view on transition processes. I hope you, you know, I could convince you a little bit that these are sort of really interesting uh, things that we haven't seen like that before in transition studies. And more importantly, I would say there's no a priori assumption about where transitions are likely to start and how they diffuse. Let's say that the trivial understanding that everything starts in the Netherlands or in California or wherever, and then you know it matures and once it's mature, it just diffuses along the development gradient is not empirically really uh, strong. We see lots of the de de developments that start, for instance, in, in Kenya or in South Africa and then grow through networks in the global south or whatever you could imagine. So the, the, the potential dynamics are very open in all dimensions. And you know, with these frameworks, you can approach it. Uh, specifically, global multiscalar aspects. Uh, I just hint here at a few publications that go into that, the regional embedding in global networks or the catch-up approach with sort of top-down development or appropriate technology approach, which is more like a bottom-up development. And finally, implications for policy. Um, for the national level, you know, even though um, we said that the national re um, reference frame is not appropriate in many cases, there's still national policymakers, um, but they also um, are increasingly exposed to the global reality or the, the reality of global innovation networks, and they have to anticipate how their interventions will impact these global structures. And this is a, a whole new field of uh, policy studies, I guess, which is really interesting. Um, at the re regional firm level, it's all about how to build up global innovation and value chains, of course. And at the global level, it's an interesting question whether we need sort of regulations to counter the innovators dilemma that um, we are observing a little bit about, you know, which countries are moving ahead with developing these new technologies, who will invest, like Germany in the 1990s and 2000s to bring down costs and everything so that in the end we will have sustainable development for all and that's very similar to the the conventional innovators dilemma where and um, you know we have patent protection for the ones that do all the investments in the beginning so they can reap some benefits in the end and these sort of things um, come then up so thanks a lot for being lenient with me taking more time than <laughs> a lot to do okay. i'm happy to to hear the questions Thanks a lot, Bernhard, for these insights. So I pass the word directly to Robert, who will react to this um, from a geographer's perspective and also kickstart you know, the discussion after that. So um, Robert, the floor is yours, if yes. uh, screen sharing works. Yeah, it looks pretty good. Yeah, but I don't want to... Oh, yeah, here we are. Yeah, thanks a lot, um, uh, Bernhard. Uh, not only Bernard, but also thanks a lot, of course, to the organizers uh, for organizing this excellent initiative. Uh, I think I, it's really interesting and really fascinating. Uh, but also let me praise uh, Bernard first and his colleagues for, for excellent uh, and impressive amount of high quality conceptual and also empirical work over the years on sustainability transition from a geographical perspective. I think they really made a huge contribution to this field and also to economic geography. It's one of the main emerging themes within economic geography that has been 
developed strongly, and I think Bernard and his colleagues have uh, yeah made huge contributions to this this field. So I think this is really something that uh, needs to be said in this uh, context. Um, as Bernard said, it's I think uh, uh, to the force a very quick one uh, about a lot of uh, interesting and uh, important uh, topics, and I think many of them will also be picked up in the future uh, webinars uh, in the context of this uh, of the webinar. So, um, but I have a few questions, and some of them have already been dealt with uh, slightly during the presentation, also in the introduction by Christian. Uh, and but some of them maybe uh, could be uh, uh, good for discussion. I mean, the first one I think has been touched upon already a little bit is what is the ultimate added value of studying sustainability transition from a geographical perspective? Christian, I think, raised the point of this uh, policymaker recommendations when he talked about this um, example of uh, uh, German energy transitions. Uh, and also uh, Bernard, I think, touched upon this uh, in the in the in the conclusions when he said, "We open up uh, sustainability transition can also start in emerging economies, uh, and uh, that was one of the issues he raised." But I think this is something we need to talk more about, maybe in the course of these webinars. What is exactly the added value, and where can we really uh, make a, an important contribution? In the abstract of today's presentation, it said that. Uh, it should enable research to address uh, challenges um, if, or is, is it some really contributing to some explanations of sustainability transitions that we would not understand if we wouldn't look uh, at these transitions from a geographical perspective? I think this is a core question. Another issue that has not been raised in the presentation is uh, uh, what about norms and values concerning sustainability? So what about the geography of norms and values concerning sustainability. I think that's a little bit, uh, got a little bit lost, partly maybe because of the global perspective, but I think it's, just, it's an important issue uh, that, uh, particularly from a geographical perspective. An issue that has been raised, but could also be discussed uh, in more detail is uh, context partic particularity versus generalizability. Um, if we of course do a lot of empirical work on case studies is highly context sensitive dependent, but what can we, uh, learn from it from at a higher level, what kind of underlying causal mechanisms can be uh, derived from these studies. A fourth question uh, I would raise is uh, the role of uh, TNCs, transnational cooperation and global production networks. Uh, it, this is a concept actually um, stemming from economic geographers, but that has not have not been mentioned by Bernard, but could also potentially play a role if we look at um, uh, the geography of sustainability transition. And last but not least, I think in the presentation, uh, there was a strong focus on global issues, globalization, global dimensions. Uh, but if we look at global globalization and global uh, development, do, don't we observe actually globalization in reverse currently? We have trade wars, we have a pandemic currently, we have other um, other processes that could lead actually to a regionalization and to a globalization in reverse. So, and what does that mean for, for the geography of sustainability transition? I think that is a, a question we could also discuss. That's about it, thanks. Okay, thanks a lot, Robert. So these are all really good, valuable and, you know, interesting points. So certainly a lot of uh, food, you know, for the discussion. Um, now, before we venture into that, there's maybe two small um, announcements. Uh, that you know about questions that came in during your presentations. One is that people ask, okay, what's the geography of the attendees of this event? And um, I can maybe reply with that quickly that um, we have the list of uh, your registration. So we'll try to make um, sort of figures out of that to sort of uh, present you in the next webinar, you know, where people come from who are actually participating in this discussion now. Um, so that's, we can't deliver this now, but we were a bit overwhelmed by all the registrations, but we will deliver on that later on. 
And then there was a second question. Actually, somebody asked, it would be an interesting uh, exercise to position everybody's work in the thematic fields that we raised at the beginning with this introductory overview. And that's something we can actually do. So we can pull up uh, another poll where we would ask you to position yourself in these fields. And if, of course, also interesting, if you work on something totally different, then also actually indicate this with others. So then we'll have a, a feeling you know, of whether we somehow cover you know, what's being discussed in this field well or not. Those would be really interesting if you could um, do that. Okay, yeah, Paul's already coming in, really nice. So we'll look at the results at the, at the end of this uh, session. Okay, so then um, that's it from the sort of um, top down presentation. Bernhard, do you have a? Yeah, I have just a question. Can I respond very shortly to Robert's point, or would we want to just collect lots of questions and then? Um, I will suggest to take up some of the big points Robert asked and connect them to questions people asked in the Q&A feature to uh, sort of, um, you know, have sort of a condensed discussion of some of the big points raised. Okay. Um, so we have um, quite some uh, questions in the Q&A already. And one issue with, which came up, which I would like to pass on to you, Bernhard, is you know, maybe related to the ultimate added value of, of the geography of transition. So people also in the in the Q&A asked, well, this policy perspective is quite top down. So if you want to inform policymakers as the ultimate aim, that's quite top down in the, the basic approach. Uh, what about sort of more bottom up sort of emergent initiatives where people are just changing, you know, their lives sort of in community based initiatives whatsoever. Um, without a lot of sort of policy influence. So couldn't another aim probably also be to contribute to these sort of initiatives and help them scale and diffuse something like that. I hope that I represent this, these questions in the right way. But yeah, what do you think about this? Do you want me to, to respond yes, to that now? Please, yeah. <laughs> we collect first and then we, I group them into bigger chunks. So. No, 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 please. This is already grouped. <laughs> oh, ah, OK. <laughs> Thank you, Christian, for grouping that. Um, yes, I guess the, 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 the added value of the geography transitions, of course, you know, this was sort of a, a question that started from the very first time that we presented the idea. Uh, people from transition studies said, yeah, well, that's just something for geographers that has no relevance for other people. <laughs> because if anything happens in a particular place that's important, we will always have it on the radar. Uh, but then it took us a long time to say, well, but perhaps the, the places, you know, where this happens are also interdependencies that then have an impact on how the technology develops, etc. So I guess the, 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 the highest added value is really in conceptual terms, you know, that you can... Um, you know, systemic approaches always try to capture the, the, all the relevant in influences, you know, that, that um, happen on a, on a regime or they happen on a, on a new technology development. And the question is, if a priori you just delimit the nation state or a specific region, you can never be sure whether you actually captured all the relevant stuff. So I would say that the first take or added value is to say, is sort of an assessment, you know, if you start to to analyze uh, biogas in the Netherlands, it's per perhaps it's very defendable, you know, because everything that matters happens actually in the Netherlands, but perhaps it's not, you know, and in the literature, it was never consciously addressed. And so I guess that's the first added value that I would bring in. Um, and the second one, and this can then be scaled, you know, to, to bigger and bigger um, issues, like the one uh, study that I showed from the China um, case that you, Christian, did, is to say, okay, if you go in a conventional sense and you just look at what happens inside China, you will sort of miss out the most important things. You cannot even explain what's going on. You really need this sort of transnational perspective before you even start uh, uh, systemic analysis. So I would say it's really about... Um, um, it's really about, it, at least what, what drives me is really about conceptual refinements and improvements. And, and what I said at the very beginning, um, it opens up a whole universe of new research questions that conventional transition studies people would never have asked in the first place. You know, because you have a different view, you have a new, new perspective, and you say, oh, you know, what happens for catching up studies? You know, if Malaysia wants to develop PV industry um, for sustainability concerns. So can we say something about that? Or, you know, will, will this be too much for our brains? Um, I would say that's the, the short answer to it. <laughs> and to the, the one from the, from the plenum, um, well, the bottom up, I, I sort of focused on um, 
on policy making, national policy making, because that has been the starting point of the literature. Uh, but of course, you can also think about other um, actors trying to push this. And you know, transition studies has always been very open to where change comes from. And of course, you can also um, talk about uh, bottom-up initiatives, grassroots movements. So um, let me just say, of course, if you say um, sustainable Ruhrmont or sustainable Utrecht or so, you know, and they just organize a citizen movement and so, that's perhaps mostly local. You don't have to bother so much about global relationships. But if you look, for instance, what we have done as well, you go into informal settlements in the global south, in urban settings of the global south, then of course you see lots of community-based organizations, um, bottom-up grassroots activities, etc. But typically they're funded by global donors. You know, that sent in their officials down to the slums in Nairobi and they, they then say what will be funded and what not will be not be funded. The national policy will be impacted by what the World Bank will say what's appropriate to, to fund and what not. So the grassroots will then get support or will not get support. The utility is trained by global utilities and they're, they're highly improving their professional standards. Um, but will be unable, we have very, a very nice study on this, will be feel uh, proved totally unable to address the needs in the local context because the only thing they can is just manage the, the regime technology that they learned from, from, <laughs> from utility operators in Hamburg, for instance, you know. Uh, but they, when they go to the slums, they, they cannot even talk to the people because they don't understand what's going on. So even in the smallest of the most bottom up uh, local context, you may still find a lot of global into connections. And so if you don't, if, you, if you're not prepared for it, you know, perhaps the sustainable the rural month can abstract from this, that's also fine, you know. But um, at least if you go into certain situations and you first check about where is this, this thing, the system that I analyzed embedded in, I guess you will end up with much better research, you know. Okay, thanks a lot. So maybe That's the short um, answer. yeah, <laughs> very short. <laughs> no, but maybe a, a related question, which is also a bit maybe also another sort of level at which we could have an added value, was by Emil um, Evenhuis, asking, you know, could one aim of the geography of transitions uh, community also be to sort of be a niche in uh, its sort of multi-scalar approach to these problems? So instead of starting from a region or, or a country or a city, to say that this is somehow in our DNA that we um, have this sort of multi-scalar perspective from the start, including other parts of the world. Um, so could this be something you know that we could put on our flag, basically? Yes, yes, I guess um, there's something legitimate that you can bring in if you, as a geographer, you're trained to be sensitive to the sort of differences, what happened in different places. And other people like economists, for instance, <laughs> have never been exposed to anything like that. They assume a priori there's no difference. And um, so I guess that's something that we can bring in to the table for, for different um, fields and etc. Um, but, you know, we first have to spell it out well, because the, the initial response is always now nah, that's, you know, geographers are obsessed with these differences, but they don't matter. So we really have to show how it matters. And also, I guess that's what I wanted to show also that it will change the, the concepts that we use, the ways of thinking, the ways of analyzing, because we will see more things and more relevant things than if we abstracted from these. And that's perhaps the, the original contribution that we can bring to the table. But it, it may take like 10, 15 years to, <laughs> to get it accepted. So in that sense, it's a niche. We're still in the niche phase and it starts to get um, sort of institutionalized more broadly, I would say. Mm -hmm. I think it's also a nice feature of this literature that from the start it was sort of also focusing on developing emerging economic contexts and not just starting from the sort of usual suspects in Holland or you know Germany or something. So I guess something to keep working on and expanding on because it really creates added value also in the conceptual development as you as you mentioned. I may okay. just add one yeah. thing when you, when you mentioned that that's also very important added value. You know, I heard over the years I heard so many students, especially PhD students, you know, which were sort of badly supervised by their professors and said, oh, I have to do some uh, transition study in the slums of Nairobi or in rural areas in Tanzania, etc. And I tried to apply the MLP, but it doesn't work. Or I did the TIS analysis on uh, solar cookers in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Ethiopia, you know, and it, it doesn't add up. And then, uh, you know, just trying to understand what was going is really that uh, the conceptual frameworks are not suitable for these sort of questions, you know, you're not able to embed it in the local specificities, 
And um, so there's really a need you know, to improve on that so that you can also translate or transplant these concepts into other, other contexts in order to still meaningfully produce something. And I guess that's also very important uh, added value of a geographically sensitive perspective. You know? Okay, thanks a lot. So maybe moving on to the second point by Robert, he also raised uh, these uh, issues about norms and values and probably the normativity of, you know, sustainability transitions sort of uh, framings. And some people also asked in the Q&A, so what about the self-awareness of the people that push for apparently sustainable uh, solutions? So um, are they aware of their own sort of positionality and, you know, does it, aren't there sort of, I think some, uh, I don't know, normative issues looming if people just push for whatever they think is sustainable? Yes, yes, yes. that's a very good question. And that has bothered the, the transitions community since the beginnings. So what's our normative stance, you know, and there are different uh, positions of people, you know, some people are really out there to say, oh, we have, it's we that have to save the world. Um, I'm a little bit more humble in these respects. So I, I think that the, the core of transition studies is really these longer term transformation processes. And the sustainability comes in because we cannot trust the markets. So we have to have some public policy perspective in that and then say, oh, we would rather want to go in this direction and that direction. And what we as researchers can contribute is really um, yeah, if you want to do that, what are, what's the way of thinking about this? How can you assess it, etc.? But frankly, I don't think that the community has any sort of original perspective on what is more sustainable or not. So for us in the research, it's always we take it from the from the con empirical context that actors push a certain solution with you know uh, sustainable uh, connotations. And then, you know, we say, okay, if this is true, then can we analyze how it works and how it could be successful without being sure that in the end, the solution will be really successful in, in sustainability terms, you know? So I guess we, we have done a, a bad job on, um, on dealing with the normativity question. And I guess the geographers in general are much more aware and have much finer grained concepts to address these issues. And, um, you know, we have been so successful by ignoring the question <laughs> that no one has a strong interest to get into this mess. But uh, the question is a bit how long we can afford to do, to behave like that. You know? mm -hmm. But that's my very personal view. You know, other people are much stronger and say, no, it's us, you know, we have to push for something because that's better for the world. I frankly, I, I really don't know, you know. Mm -hmm. okay. Not me, I mean, in the end, I, you know, I also want to contribute that things will get better, but um, it's not, if I was the dictator of the world, you know, I'd say, will not yet be the solution, I would say. <laughs> okay. Nor most of the other colleagues in the transition studies, <laughs> I would want to add. I know. Okay, so maybe moving to the issue about context versus generalizability. There's also some questions that relate to that point raised by yes. Robert. And one is that, you know, would you assume that all transitions have to move through these different scales in a way? Or would it also be a sort of a valuable thing if a transition happens in some place, uh, the specific, you know, scale, and then it transforms local structures and that's enough? Or do, it, do you assume that it always sort of scales and diffuses through different sort of um, scalar levels in different places? And then also related to that, of course, with the multi-scalar perspective, you can always disintegrate these dynamics into more and more sort of scales and then isn't this sort of infinite at a certain point? So where, how to cut this into meaningful pieces, this multi-scalar perspective is probably the question there. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, this also relates to the last question of Robert, you know, about uh, mm -hmm. globalization in reverse. And I guess we have struggled, uh, Christian and I have struggled a lot with the title of our global innovation systems uh, framework, because actually it's a little bit a misnomer, but let's say a sexy misnomer, so finally we fell for it, you know, <laughs> in marketing terms. Uh, because I guess the framework is nothing particular with global, that it's really a multi-scalar conceptual framework. So you could as well with the same ideas, you can analyze what happened in the 90s and 2000s in Germany between the local level and the, the federal states level and the national level, you know, how the different formation processes went up and down. And that would nicely be covered to, uh, with the framework. And um, so let's say the, the global aspect, because I was asked to, or, you know, I interpreted the multiscaler in saying, well, the, the most pressing and the, the most complex questions are really um, formulated at the global level. So if you can just illustrate how this framework will be useful for global level sort of problems, um, then it, we can safely also apply it, but not in a sequential order, but let's say, 
you can safely apply it also at, low, at more specific scales and just interact between a local city and the region, you know, and what happens at multi-scalar activities. Or you know, we have a recent paper in production about China, two provinces, which went different courses in PV, you know, in Inner Mongolia and Jiangsu, centralized and decentralized. Um, and that's, you can just frame this in totally different, uh, same, in the same sort of conceptual language. So in that sense, um, as I said at one point in my presentation, this megalomaniac multi-layered um, regime and TIS framework has in 99% of the cases will be cut down to very specific um, questions. And it's more like a back cloth where you, you can say, oh, did I miss out anything that's really of relevance for my research question? And then in the end, you can have quite simple uh, research questions and research settings. You don't have to go for all the complexity all the way up. You know? Yes, if I may add to that, I think this is also highly con uh, sector specific. So in some sectors like the water sector, we see that there's a very strong global regime structure, which is influential uh, throughout the plant in a way. So there's multinational companies, big investors, donors that basically influence strongly, you know, how infrastructure is looking in in, uh, in African cities, in, in, uh, in the US and in Japan. It's a similar sort of actors that uh, sort of influence what's going on. So there, if you transform in one sort of region, I think you don't really uh, lead to a sectoral transformation, but you have to somehow translate these new ideas to a global level sort of actor structure with TNCs and you know a different yes. quality of actors involved whereas in other cases like maybe transportation there's a, a lot of diversity in regimes already existing in different countries and so there if you actually transform one place this is um, probably enough and in other sort of contexts would have to transform in a different way so also there this is really context dependent I would say so yes. okay um, yes so thanks for these questions so we also covered a little bit on the TNCs with this response uh, but no, there's probably more just, too yes can I just add to that part and of course you know these are all quite new ideas you know they're, they're a few years old um, but we're still at the beginning of uh, filling it up with empirical research and and also branching out and bridging to to other activities of, of people who have worked on similar issues since long and so the, the whole issue about global value chains, global production networks, uh, transnational companies. Um, so we, we um, endeavored <laughs> a few times to engage with the global, um, the global, um, the, the catch-up studies literature, you know, um, and the, the folks that meet uh, in the global X conferences, etc., uh, because they have discovered by their own, you know, the green industries, etc. And to, to create a sort of a productive uh, trading zone, and we have a few uh, papers with Shaoshan Yap uh, to uh, to bridge this. Um, it's not let's let's put it like this: it's not equally easily to bridge out to to different communities. Some are more welcoming, and others are more reluctant. Mm -hmm. And let's say that the economic geography crowd has been a bit reluctant at the beginning, but then fell in love very very quickly. <laughs> so, this was more easy and in other other uh, fields it's sort of more difficult to build the bridges you know? okay talking about other communities bill clark asked uh, asked a seemingly very interesting question and had some ideas on how to tackle multi uh, uh, in other fields so bill um, are you there you maybe it's best if you ask the question it's hard to translate probably in the right way <laughs> Um, uh, yes, I'm, I'm here. Uh, so thank you. Um, uh, just an incredibly stimulating presentation. Um, I wanted, though, to, to push you a little bit on uh, the relationship between your use of, of the concepts of, of scale, of multi-levels, uh, and of connections. And I do that because of uh, the experience in a related field, which is uh, evolutionary biogeography, has all the right terms in it. It's like yours, but it's about biology, not technologies. And there, um, we got ourselves totally wound up in knots using the word scale to do what turned out to be two different jobs. One was the job of wherever it was you wanted to start studying, and that could be local or regional or whatever. Uh, we understood that you needed to look both up a level, so let's say from region to globe, to see how climate change was affecting your place, and down a level to see what was bubbling up, the standard stuff from niche theory and MLP. But we also understood that you needed to look uh, horizontally 
at what was going on in other regions like yours, say another island or another continent that might then be horizontally connected, transferred into yours. Those turned out to be operationally much more helpful guidance to doing the research. That is, uh, look vertically across multiple levels, look horizontally at the same level for causal connections than the mess we'd gotten ourselves into arguing about scalars and stuff. So I'm wondering if you can tease out a little bit what scale means for you and translate it into these vertical and horizontal levels that have turned out to be more productive in a related field. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I hope no one would ask this question, <laughs> frankly, because it's really, <laughs> it's really difficult. And um, you know, I, I used um, scale here in a rather loose way, um, and I was expecting us from geographers to say, well, but you know, you're you're using it in a very non-reflexive way, and um, so you know, there's there's a whole complexity between I mean, how you understand what's global and what's local, and how it's framed by whom and under which conditions, and of course, you know, I just let all this complexity out of the picture to sort of um, you know formulate the idea: how do we have to extend and to transform? enlarge the, the conceptual frameworks to at least get a grasp on these sort of things. And I would include, um, you know, there's nothing um, in, in the geographic innovation systems framework as we have framed it, you can also look at more horizontally, horizontally connected regions and not how they sort of team up with perhaps a sort of an overarching connecting level, you know, with exchange uh, um, experiences. Um, but this is not a very deep you know, philosophical understanding of scale. And I personally, I found myself not very, by the few things I read about it, not very inspired in a, in a positive way, perhaps for no good reasons, because it was too complex for me or whatever. And um, so, so our proposal is quite pragmatic down to earth. Um, but I'm no doubt, you know, when developing this further, we will sort of get into these traps and discover the complexities, etc. But um, so far, we're perhaps still not far enough to, to have discovered the, the real challenges here. Um, but let's say just one example, a very notable study that was done by uh, Franz Sengers and Rob Raven about uh, business rapid transport in several uh, uh, countries in the global south from Latin America and Thailand, etc. And how the, this uh, concept developed um, as networks between these countries and, and agents traveling across, etc. So I think this is would be perfectly, uh, is a perfectly uh, well illustration of what we would count under multiscalar, even if it happens only at one scale, but in different places. You know? I don't know whether this is sort of a satisfying answer, but um, it show, perhaps show, just shows that I, I don't have a good answer <laughs> right now, you know. So, but it's a good question, at least, you know. <laughs> thanks a lot Thank for that. Um, there's actually, Ron Boschma asked a similar question. So then he said also, okay, if you go multi-scalar, you of course add complexity mm -hmm. to what you're looking at. And so then what can you still sort of, do you just see like context specific patterns or can you still generalize them from this? And so my uh, sp spontaneous reaction would be again to say, well, probably you can um, analyze different sectors for their sort of multi-scalar transition patterns and then typologize them a little bit and come up with sort of, um, you know, a typology of, you know, how sectors are basically structured in a multi-scalar way. And then, you know, where you could intervene. So there could be general patterns where you can group the water sector together with oil and gas and maybe uh, the transport sector together with sustainable housing and then make sort of generaliz generalizable claims of, you know, where you could sort of intervene or where the relevant transition um, trajectories will happen at a certain point in time. So that would be my response, but I'm, I'm not sure whether you have something to add to that. Yeah, just again, a rather pragmatic answer. I guess, you know, it's it's true, you know, if you bring in the geography and multiscolarity, you add complexity. And as human brains, we're only capable to manage so much, so you have to cut it in another way. And I guess that perhaps the thing that we propose here is the way to, to get aware of the complexities <clears throat> and then we haven't spelled this out in, in any good form yet, but but let's say that the consequence would be to say, okay, I have this and this problem. How do we have to cut the cake? You know, as Bill said, do I have to cut it uh, horizontally or is it just uh, something about, let's say, uh, local uh, community-based organizations in, uh, in Kibera in, in Nairobi getting interventions from Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, you know, and, and it's officials, you know, <laughs> to have a sort of a very local and very global um, interaction that plays out or, 
you know, there can be many different things that, that can be come into the focus, that come can come into the focus of analysis, and so that, that the complexity still stays manageable. I guess I still wanted to present the big picture in order to say, okay, that's the size of the world. And now I have to find, you know, how my re specific research questions fit into that framework. And hopefully this will still, um, you know, be productive for how you then conduct the, the actual analysis. Mm -hmm. So it's more of a framework to sort out things than, than saying, well, that's the ultimate, you know, you have to go more and more and more complex. Um, but let me just add this part, you know, <laughs> it was also in my presentation. Um, of course, this is, in a sense, this is also the cheap way out. And with our social technical network analysis, we still try to take the, the, the bull by the horns in a way and say, okay, perhaps there's still something that we can learn and how we can depict um, processes at higher levels of complexity that can still be interesting. It's not, let's say, the ultimate form and everyone has to do it, but there's a sort of a, a specific realm where you, these sort of global views and long-term dynamics can just add insights of a substantial form. Yeah. Okay, so we're quickly reaching the end of this session, but there's two more questions that I would like to highlight. Um, and one of them connects back to also the question about globalization in reverse uh, to some degree. There's various people also asking about, you know, actually post growth ideas and the end of, of neoliberalism. I mean, it's sort of clear that neo neoliberal capitalism is a, a sort of a naked emperor now and a lot of the sort of anti-globalist movements can probably be positioned in the same field. So how to deal with these yeah, uh, issues, the sort of globalization in reverse, anti sort of capitalist movements and how, what could we, how could we deal with those issues? Yeah, I guess the best thing I can say is that I don't know much about it. I see this as a challenge. I don't see an easy way to address it. It's very legitimate and we should work that out, but um, I should not go on for 10 minutes just elaborating <laughs> that I have no clear ideas on that. I guess it's a, a big open topic. Of course, we have a sort of a connotation of industry dynamics and strong institutional structures, etc., which is embedded, you know, in, th in these days, it's embedded in a sort of a capitalist, uh, in its many forms, uh, environment. And if you want to move away from that, this will not primarily be a technology issue. Um, and we have been strongly ins inspired by technological dynamics. So we're perhaps not the best people to, to address this, but it would be a very relevant uh, field, you know, for interactions uh, uh, to then reach out and learn from each other, you know. Yeah, so it's only a quickly also evolving team in the transition community yes. and in geography, it has been there for a long time. So yes, just yes, another yes. place, maybe also for a, fo a follow-up event at some point, this could be really interesting. Yes, yes. Okay, so then maybe the last question um, is about, okay, so what the, about the practical implications of uh, these results? So could we develop sort of a toolbox for decision makers in firms and policy and NGOs, you know, on how to deal with these complex multi-scalar issues and also maybe help people that implement pilots or demonstration projects on the ground? So what could they get from this? Yes, I think, first of all, there's plenty. Um, I don't know the size of the toolbox yet, you know, and uh, how quickly it will be constructed. I always say that's something that Christian can do before his retirement. <laughs> it will probably take a long, lot of time, you know, to, um, to get there. But I see plenty of, um, of, of implications that this has immediately. So one of the things, if I may just uh, say this, this anecdote, I presented a very early form of the Global Innovation Systems Framework once in Lund at the EUSPRI conference. And after that, the, um, uh, one, a policymaker came to me and said, oh, finally, I was waiting for this talk for 10 years of my career because everyone else is just telling me about what I can do in my local system. But the reality is really that uh, everything we want to intervene with has sort of this global, global interconnections and we don't know how to deal with this. And, um, and I guess that's sort of a, a nice framing of, uh, of sort of a, a context in which you can then start to create tools and, and perspectives for policymakers, for strategy makers of all, all sorts. Not that we proceeded then for, for technical reasons, we, we didn't get far with this, um, this offering that was there, but I'm, I'm very sure that there's uh, plenty of things, um, you know, national industrial policy in global context. So what are sort of the the things you have to look at, how do you have to analyze the global innovation systems that then are anchored in your, your specific country, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and there's 
plenty, you know, it's really plentiful. And this would be another talk, you know, to say, well, where are the areas where these, these frameworks could have a sort of a, a policy relevance at one point, but it will take time, you know, it's not something that you just do a snip of a finger, you know. Okay, so thanks a lot for this. Um, thanks a lot to Bernhard for the presentation, to Robert for a very sort of really uh, set of very stimulating uh, questions. And to all of you for your inputs, I really apologize that I couldn't cover all of your points, um, but I hope that we had, a, I still think we had a sort of a nice overarching discussion of the, the main points, I hope. Otherwise, feel free to get in touch with all of us at any time. And now I still owe you actually two things. So one is the results from our last questionnaire. I will try to um, show them to you. Can you see the results now on the thematic yes. field? Great. So this is a really great uh, sort of uh, result for, for myself because it looks like you could all position yourself somehow in the sort of thematic fields that we outlined at the beginning. So it's not like uh, all of you are actually in the others category, which is really nice. And I think it's quite interesting to see that the uh, multiscolarity, institutional structure agency, New industrial path development, power politics and justice, and these grassroots community initiatives are about the, the ones that are most often mentioned, quickly followed by urban ecology, urban experimentation, and placemaking. So this could also be that some of the sort of urban transition people are not joining this uh, webinar because there's other events too that may be more relevant. But anyways, quite interesting to see that we seem to have somehow covered the field more or less um, nicely. So that's good to know. And then I also owe you the information about the next um, webinar. Um, so this is going to be a weekly event. Um, I will share my screen very quickly. And next week we will have indeed um, a presentation on the sort of um, uh, institutional perspectives. Um, wait, I will show you the last slide. So Simone Strambach and Gesa Plitsch will present on, here we go, um, developing a sort of institutional conceptualization of regional transition dynamics. Uh, you can uh, register, you know, on our webpage, we will, you will get a follow-up email with the link to the registration. And then we will also put all the information on this uh, webpage um, and probably also disseminate to other places. So you get also the recording of the session and the, the PPTs and uh, um, yes, the background papers too. So, Thanks a lot for um, this first session. This was really a lot of fun, really interesting. And I hope that you all join us again um, in this uh, next session. And, you know, if you have other ideas and questions, always get back in touch with us at, at any time. Mm. So, Thank you as well. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Christian. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. So this is it. Um, if there's no other interventions, then we would close this session now and see you next week, hopefully. Have a good uh, evening. See you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs>